Our speaker today is Dr. Devin Oler. He's a primary care and addiction medicine physician and served as one of the first rural health leadership fellows at the chief at, and chief resident at Massachusetts General Hospital before coming to UK. He is an associate program director for the University of Kentucky Internal Medicine Residency Program and an investigator for the NIH funded healing community study. Devin Oler. Thanks so much, John. Um, so uh, very briefly, from a financial disclosure standpoint, my spouse um, and I have not had any relevant financial relationships during the past 12 months. Um, the practice gap and supporting resources for this presentation, so language can be used intentionally or unintentionally to perpetuate stigma in a healthcare setting. Changing our language is a crucial component of reducing stigma to improve the lives and health of people who use drugs or alcohol and people with addiction. Our learning objectives for today are to identify language that can be used intentionally or unintentionally to perpetuate stigma, explain the importance of using medically appropriate language for substance use disorder, and use effective terminology when discussing substance use disorder. Our expected outcome for this presentation um, is to utilize client-centered, person-first language um, for clients with substance use disorder and to recognize personal bias or the bias of others when treating clients with substance use disorder. So we actually have a pretty small group um, and we're doing mostly interactive cases today. And so I thought it might be nice to, to do some brief introductions. And so what I'll ask you to do is I'll say your name and if you're able to unmute um, and share what county you're joining from and what your profession um, would be, I think that would be great. Um, so just going down here, John and Chris gave um, their introductions. Um, Amy, uh, Anas, can you um, introduce yourself? I'm hoping you guys can hear me this week. Yes. Good, 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 good. I am Amy Annis. I am a registered nurse for 19 years now, and I'm actually the prevention specialist for the Boyle County uh, Healing Community Study, and I'm also a person in recovery. Awesome. Um, so glad you're here. Um, I have next on my list, uh, Kathy Miles. Hi, I'm Kathy Miles. Uh, I am a LCADC and LMFT and uh, am uh, currently the coordinator of the Boyle County um, ASAP. Good to see you again, Kathy. Uh, Good to see you, thanks. I have uh, Jay King as the next person. Good uh, morning, I am Jennifer King. I am a registered nurse for almost 32 years now. I work with Bluegrass Care Navigators as part of the lead uh, overseeing the project here for the from the clinical aspect for our healing community study. We're really excited about Bluegrass Care Navigators helping us out. Um, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, I have uh, Anna Ross as the next person. Hello, um, I'm Anna, obviously. Um, I'm the program assistant at Voices of Hope. Um, so we're kind of in all of the counties kind of sporadically. Um, I'm also in long-term recovery and a certified peer support specialist. Very cool. Thanks, Anna. I have another Anna, Anna thomas Bryan. it looks like. That is me. I am Anna and I am a CSW social worker at Bluegrass Community Health Center. Very cool. Um, Candy Sturgeon. I am a registered nurse with Bluegrass Care Navigators. Sorry, Candy, you cut out for a second there. Did you hear anything that I said? Uh, no, but we can hear you now. Okay. So my name is Candy. I'm a registered nurse um, for Bluegrass Care Navigators, and I am the Hill nurse. Thanks so much for joining us, Candy. Uh, Carla. Hello, I'm Carla. Um, I'm in Fayette County, a recovery coach for Voices of Hope and am also in recovery. Good to see you again, Carla. Thank you, you too. Um, I have Gabby next. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Gabby Deaton. I am the Kenton County Prevention Specialist for HEAL. Uh, Helen. 
Good afternoon or good morning. Um, my name is Helen and I am the Prevention Specialist for Fayette County. So glad to have you here, Helen. Thank you. Um, let's see, Jamie Cody. Good morning, Jamie Cody. I am here in Perry County and I'm the Transitions Program Supervisor for Bluegrass Care Navigators uh, Transitions Department and I'll be leading our team of care navigators um, who will be working in the various wave one and, and wave two counties um, doing care navigation. So really excited. Thanks, Jamie. Um, Jimmy Chadwell. Hey, everybody. My name is Jimmy. I'm a recovery coach here at Voices of Hope, and I'm also a peer support specialist, and I'm a person in recovery as well. Thanks. Long time no see. Good to see you, Jimmy. Um, I have uh, Katie Fight. Hi guys, I'm Katie. I am, it is actually my first week, so this is my first time joining you guys. Um, I am the recovery coach for Kitten County's HEAL program, and I'm also a person in recovery as well. Thanks, Katie. <clears throat> Dr. Panuki. Hi, I'm Laura Finucchi. I'm a primary care and addiction medicine physician at the University of Kentucky. Um, and I'm a member of the treatment team on the Healing Community Study. Dr. Lawfall. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Lawfall. I'm a psychiatrist, um, addiction medicine doctor, and I'm also on the treatment team. And um, I'm excited to um, hear the rest of this. Um, session today and uh, welcome everyone it's yes, awesome welcome this is a good crowd um natalie and um, my name is natalie Lowe. i'm an rn i will be the project heal nurse for floyd county thanks so much natalie um i have peace up next Sorry, I was trying to unmute there. Hey everyone, my name is Julie. Actually, I go by my middle name. So Julie Nakaima and uh, my profession is public health and I'm currently working on the HEAL study um, on the data team. So I'm a data management specialist. Thanks Julie. Thank you. Um, Phoebe. Long time no see everyone. Um, <laughs> I am Phoebe. I am with Voices of Hope in primarily the heal, heal program coordinator. So i um, writing down everybody's names because you guys will be getting to know each other very well through email and Zoom. Thanks, baby. Shannon. Hey, uh, I'm located in Madison County. Um, I do employment for people in recovery in Fayette County through New Vista. And in Madison County, I'm with the Recovery Community Center there. Um, and uh, yeah, also long-term recovery. Thanks so much, Shannon. And Tim? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm Tim Burton. No, I, I'm not the director, so sorry <laughs> to disappoint you, but uh, I am the uh, recovery coach for Boyd and Floyd Counties. I'm a new hire with Voices of Hope, but I'm, along with Katie, we're in our first week, so I can't say how excited I am to be a part of this group and to be a part of uh, what's going on here. Excellent. Thanks for joining us. Vanessa. Hey, um, I'm a person in recovery and I'm the recovery coach working with Madison and Clark counties here at Voices of Hope. Awesome. So thanks for those introductions, folks. Um, today is going to be a little bit different. So rather than have a classic didactic session where I just go over PowerPoint slides and talk at you guys, this is going to be more of a collaborative session. We're going to go over a couple of uh, real life cases. Um, we have removed the names from these cases and changed some of the, the exact situations to protect the privacy of, of these individuals. Um, and we'll do so with, with all of our case-based sessions here with KY Open. Um, we record these sessions, and so we want to make sure that we're protecting people's privacy and, and that that information is not coming out when we release these, these videos. So um, uh, just so all you know, that is happening. We're recording these sessions, and so we want to protect patient privacy. We can go in and edit out things if, um, 
uh, there's a slip of the tongue um, uh, somewhere in here. But uh, again, I, I uh, want to respect the privacy, uh, both of our, our patients in the communities that they're coming from. Um, so let me orient you to how each of these cases are going to go. So um, I have a couple cases today. Um, but certainly if a case comes to mind, um, uh, you all can jump in um, and uh, present one. So what will happen is uh, we'll talk about a question that comes up from a certain case that we ran into. And this might be um, you know, a client that you see in clinic or that you talk to over the phone um, or that you just hear about um, peripherally. Um, and, uh, but we want to base our discussion around that particular question that you have for our learning community here with KY Open. To better allow us as um, experts and, and everyone as um, sort of community experts uh, to answer this question, we want to have a little bit more information about each case. So we'll go over th what the problem is. Um, so in a few sentences describing the client situation, we'll go over your perspective. So what your experience is, your training, um, and how you were approaching the problem um, uh, plays into to this particular question. And then uh, the purpose, right? So why you wanted to bring this question to the group and what you're hoping to learn from the discussion. Um, so I think of it as the P's and the Q, okay? So the problem, perspective, purpose, and the question that you have for the group. Um, so to give us an example, I'm actually gonna start with a case that I saw. Um, so I am going to um, actually type on here as we're going through this um, to better document um, some of the topics that we're going over. Give me one second here. Okay, so the question that I actually had for the group here um, is what do you do when you hear stigmatizing language used in mutual health groups? Let me tell you a little bit about the situation that my client was going through. So um, he's an individual with opioid use disorder, um, was doing well on buprenorphine, naloxone or suboxone, um, and was also attending AA, uh, sorry, NA meetings and really got a lot out of those meetings. But one thing that um, the client was running into was uh, they were hearing uh, a lot about how um, Suboxone was a crutch and he would never really be clean until he tapered um, down and off of Suboxone. So hearing, you know, crutch, never be clean while on Suboxone. And that really ate at him. Um, he uh, wanted to start tapering Suboxone with me. Um, and I acknowledged some of the concerns that I had, um, but was willing to, to begin reducing that. Um, but we ran into more cravings and he ended up having a slip. Um, we were able to get him back into care but still had a lot of concerns about this idea of needing the crutch, okay? In terms of, of my perspective, you know, I'm a primary care doctor and an addiction medicine doc. Um, I'm not in recovery. In the past, I co-led um, smart recovery meetings with a peer support specialist. Um, so I know how much these mutual help groups can 
assist our, our patients who are struggling with addiction. Um, but I don't have that same perspective as someone in recovery. Um, and then in terms of the purpose and why I thought this case might be helpful for us to discuss as a group, um, I find it really challenging uh, to respond to comments that come up in mutual help groups because I'm not always sure what prompted the person in that group to, to share that or to use that potentially stigmatizing language. Um, was it internalized stigma? And that's why they were calling it a crutch. Um, was it that they had a bad experience with a, a doctor um, or advanced uh, practice pr practitioner, right? Um, or bad experience with medication. It's just tough for me to respond um, to language like this without knowing those individuals' personal experience. Um, and I also find it challenging because as somebody who um, believes deeply in, in the disease model of addiction, that this is a chronic disease with a good prognosis, with effective treatment, I don't have um, as catchy a catchphrase as you know one day at a time or some of the other language that's used in, in mutual aid groups. We don't have sort of those, those same um, catchphrases that we can use for um, the disease model. So um, that's how we lead, like sort of cases to be presented. So sort of the question and the three Ps, the problem, the perspective, and the purpose. And the next step when we're going over these cases is to sort of open it up to the group first to see if there's any um, uh, clarifying questions you have for the case presenter, which in this case is, is me. Um, so any questions that you had about this particular case? And I'm, I'm gonna look at the chat box as well. If there's not any clarifying questions, um, oh, Amy, great question. I realize this is specific to NAAA, but did this person have a sponsor through those programs? Um, so good question. They were sort of looking for a sponsor when this issue was, was coming up um, and was having, they were having a little bit of anxiety about um, finding a sponsor, but they had identified a few people that might be good candidates to become their sponsor. Other clarifying questions? Okay, so we can then, um, let's see here. So no, no sponsor then, yep. Um, so uh, I want to hear sort of uh, some perspectives from the group on, on how they might address um, or answer this question of what you should do when you hear stigmatizing language used in mutual help groups. This is probably not gonna actually answer your question, Dr. Oler, but this is just some personal perspective that I yeah. really had wanted to share last week and then my Zoom went all crazy. Um, this is absolutely alive and well in all of those type of meetings. Um, I personally, as a person in recovery for nearly seven years now, um, I utilized medication in the beginning to help get me on a path to recovery. And the only thing that I was able to do was to find a sponsor that I knew that I could be completely honest with and stuff that I still was uncomfortable sharing at the group level, which is not a good way to be. And so um, I absolutely credit 
um, medication for helping me to get on the path. And I also absolutely credit these meetings for saving my life. I mean, no doubt I would not be where I am seven years later without all of this. Um, but it's so real and it's such an issue that I am still involved in local mutual aid groups and with my job here at the university as the prevention specialist, like when we do our, our campaign stuff, there's certain stuff that I know is not going to be well perceived there. And so I don't know where we, so I guess I'm opening it up to a whole nother question. Like, I really don't know how to fix that problem. I do know that um, my sponsor and people that were very close in my support group know my particular story. And so I do feel like here locally for me, they would guide people to me that did use medication just because of they knew that I had some experience with that and how it helped and how, um, you know, how I navigated through those roads of those mutual aid groups um, being on medication because you absolutely feel ostracized. I mean, there's no, there's no two ways about it. So um, that was kind of the point I was wanting to bring up last week and just, it kind of fits in with this. So I thought I'll just present the other question is how do we get to that point and what do we do? Amy, I, I want to echo a couple important things that you're saying there. So one is um, sort of taking that personal approach, right? And that the power of the personal story um, can be really important here. Somebody else who might be going through um, what you went through some years ago um, could benefit a lot from, from hearing um, and, and sharing that, that knowledge. Um, and then the other critical point that you, you bring up is like, this is a very real barrier for many people um, getting into care and staying in care. Um, and we touched on this this last week, um, but we know that um, uh, stigma is one of the main contributors um, to people not even initiating um, medications for opioid use disorder. Um, Shannon brings up a good point. Um, uh, so Shannon says, it's important to go where the, where the empathy is, whatever the problem. Um, I think it would be good to encourage the participant to seek out others who utilize MOUD. Um, so that, that is a big point, is, is, is this the right sort of community for this particular individual? There are um, great mutual help groups that are more receptive to um, MOUD. Um, I'm thinking of Mara and, and Smart Recovery, um, and some others as well. Um, Dr. Lothwall shares that as a provider, I have seen patients who can ignore the stigmatizing language and still benefit from the group without internalizing the sense of shame or feeling not clean, um, but some other patients are hurt by it. And I don't feel, sorry, I don't feel like they can say anything in the group because they are just one person in the group and the group may not hear them and further reject them. Trying to find groups that are open to MOUD is, is really important. Uh, I agree with Shannon. Um, Gabby um, says, I would recognize their experience and empathize, this come back again, that empathy word, um, with those feelings as a person in recovery and an active member of AA. I agree with Amy, stigma is very alive. It's very real that an individual may not find someone in AA or NA who will work with them. I would highly suggest referring them to meetings that support MOUD. Historically, there haven't been many. Now they are emerging. This can be life-changing. Um, and Amy just echoes, you know, I, I let go of the things that weren't beneficial to me and um, hung onto the ideals I learned to hold so dear to get me on this path. Um, I think that's a really important theme here as well is um, you can take the things that are helping you and, and drop the things that are, are not helping you. Um, I do this all the time as a physician. I have, to, I have to process all this information that is coming in about say my primary care patients or my patients who are struggling with addiction. And I have to make decisions about what is going to um, help them best and what is going to not help them. Um, and part of that is, is uh, doing some education with the client or with the patient that's in front of me. Um, but another part is understanding their priorities um, and making sure that my priorities are matching up with them as well. Get, getting to uh, another point that this case brings up, um, uh, what about the specific language of 
crutch or clean? How can we respond to that when we're hearing um, our clients echo that same language um, in talking with us? Hey, it's Shannon. Um, yeah. I think uh, just taking the time to explain why you would you why you use a different word, like not just recasting it and not just using your word and continuing on. Um, I think, yeah, taking the time to say, I like this word because of X, Y, and Z. And then you're not asking them to change their word. You're just giving them a little bit more information. And I think it's um, easier to absorb that and it's easier to process that when you can just have the information and you're not asked to do anything with it because some of those um, some of the jargon that we use kind of becomes part of your identity because it's how you signal to others that you're part of that group so asking someone to drop that can be more than what you think you're asking is all I'm saying right um and uh, both Vanessa and, and Tim um, make a great point of there's nothing wrong using a crutch when you need it. Um, and if you had a broken leg, you would need a crutch as well. Um, use those tools. And Amy, a great point, you know, making the, the uh, medical um, analogy of we wouldn't use a blood pressure medication as a crutch for somebody with high blood pressure. You know, it's, it's another chronic disease. Um, so echoing that disease-focused language, um, but I think everyone can learn from what Shannon was saying of, of how we frame that, right? If we're saying, you know, I feel that it's important to use um, medications for opioid use disorder rather than MAT um, because medications for opioid use disorder um, suggest that that could be sort of the primary treatment for their opioid use disorder, um, rather than just something assisting counseling or assisting groups um, like MAT suggests. And Phoebe is echoing um, what Amy was saying as well. Um, so as a reminder from last week, let me just pull up a slide here. And I'm going to delete some of these annotations so you can see this a little bit more clearly. So this was from last week. Um, we talked about problematic words or phrases and some suggested alternatives. Um, so when we're saying, you know, I feel it's important um, that I don't use the word addict or users, it's because individuals are not defined by their disease, right? Um, they do have that disease and we need to acknowledge that, but they aren't defined by that. Or I feel that it's, um, that I, I shouldn't be using the word clean or dirty when talking about um, somebody's status of their recovery or remission or their urine drug screen um, because it doesn't actually give me much information. And it may just make that person feel worse if I am calling them dirty or calling any aspect of, of them dirty. Um, so instead, I like to just describe the results um, of the urine test. I don't always use the, the term relapse, right? I usually reflect the language used by the patient, um, which is often slip or return to use. Remembering that relapse would suggest that multiple facets of that disease of addiction are now active, right? Um, it's impairing work or it's, a, it's causing medical complications. Um, or um, there's a, a lack of, of control um, that we're seeing as well. Um, whereas a one-time use might not suggest a full relapse. And then um, we talked about medication assisted treatment versus medications for opioid use disorder. We talked about former or reformed addict and alcoholic and how again, that, um, uh, that, that doesn't, um, uh, that's, that gets away from our focus of the person having the disease rather be, than being defined by the disease. Okay. So let's go back for a second here.
Devin, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, so as a provider, um, I try to frame those kind of arguments the same way um, as you all are chatting about that, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of um, chronic illnesses that we use medications and sometimes these medications are lifelong and sometimes they're not. And we don't think of them as crutches. Um, we think of them as uh, medications that, you know, improve your health and quality of life and help you live as long a productive life as you can. So, um, and then at this, at the same time, there are um, chronic illnesses like diabetes and heart disease and some cancers that, that mutual support groups are really helpful and it's normal to, to receive both um, behavioral modifications, mutual support and medications as all part of a, um, a treatment plan. And so I'm curious um, for those of you that are active in, in mutual support, do you think that how often do those kinds of discussions come up that parallel um, the conversations that patients might be having with their providers? And do you think that that would be well received at all to start kind of opening up the dialogue about changing the language from medicine being a crutch to <laughs> medicine being really important and life-saving and um, and it doesn't, it's not exclusive of people also receiving benefit from um, recovery communities and such. So just framing that question, um, you know, we, we in the medical community see the importance of these groups um, because they parallel what we see in other disease processes, whether it's cancer, uh, diabetes, um, and the importance of a peer helping guide and helping you navigate that chronic disease. Um, but we're just wondering it, w what level of comfort is there in, in bringing up that particular topic? And is there, is there receptivity to um, this idea of, you know, hey, like, let's try to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to, to use something that might change their life. This is Gabby. Um, it was probably way too much to put into the chat. So I really believe that that question is so, would be answered so differently at every meeting mm -hmm. or population. Um, I think that as time goes on, it is becoming more accepted, but I think that we still have so far to go. Um, I would say, you know, it, it depends on, on who's saying it, who is comfortable saying it, um, anyone who knows me knows I'll, I'll talk about anything. I'm, I'm, I'm not shy. I'm not afraid to kind of go against the, you know, the group. Um, but a lot of people are, and especially when individuals have been in these programs for 20, 30, 40 years and are very, um, very adamant on what is sober or recovery and what is not. So it can be very intimidating for people. Um, I think here in the last few years, people are realizing um, that people are continuously dying. Yeah. And so um, with the surge of heroin and, and fentanyl, um, so I think that people are becoming more open. I think that it's still gonna take a long time and hopefully programs like Heal and Vo Voices for Hope um, will continue to push that forward. Just kind of like how I said, historically, there there really hasn't been many people in the past advocating for it and speaking up. Um, so, so hopefully these things will, will have a big um, change. Gabby, as you were talking, you were getting multiple kudos in the chat box. Um, people agreeing with exactly everything you're saying, how it can be very much group to group um, who's saying and who's coming out with that, 
you know, honest statements about um, medications for opioid use disorder. Um, we really appreciate a, um, uh, your willingness to, to chat about this because it's such a critical topic. Um, I wanted to see sort of where people were at as we were going through this. Um, so if you would, on this scale, the, if you go up in the, um, on, on Zoom, you should see an option to annotate. And if you click on annotate, and then um, you click on uh, stamp, you can choose a star or an X, and you can put the star or the X where you feel like you're at on this spectrum from not at all comfortable in addressing this issue um, in mutual aid groups or totally comfortable. How you do that one more time, or? Yeah, so you click the annotate button and then um, you'll see a, a, a sort of a taskbar come up and you'll see the option for stamp. And somebody figured out the heart, uh, <laughs> which is great. Right, and I think what this is speaking to um, big time is that it, it, many of you folks joining are, are, are really leaders in this as well. Um, and a lot of people are looking up to you and looking for guidance on, on this particular thing. And so modeling um, that language around, you know, this is why I use this term because stigma kills, right? Um, and then discussing the things openly is awesome. Something that I wanted to add was um, the space that the recovery community could have these conversations amongst themselves. Like obviously, you know, one-on-one uh, -on -one is, is great, but that's gonna take a while. Um, so like our recovery community center, we have a business meeting every month and members can bring up topics about money or culture. And we often talk about things like that. You know, how do we, how do we wanna welcome the newcomer? It's all the spirit of it's all about the newcomer and stuff like that. But for groups, um, they have what's called a group conscience every month and they do their business at those meetings um, as well. So um, I think that would be a really good time to kind of start conversations. Um, and some home groups, they'll let other people come and sit in and speak. Um, like, I think it would have to be somebody in recovery, but I have seen um, open group conscience where you can say, hey, here's something I think that's going on in the wider community. And then also there's, um, district meetings so you have like a, a what is it called a group a G, it's called a gsr but i can't remember what it stands for right now um but those will be really yeah district um service managers and stuff so there's there's a hierarchy and if you could even like get the conversation going at the world service group then you could get the literature changed but to change literature in a 12-step group is it has to be a unanimous decision so it is very rare but the, the lower group conscience level, I think would be the way to go. I love that of, of thinking about like the organizational structure and, um, and allowing um, that group to speak with one voice, even if it's a multifaceted voice, right? Um, on this particular issue. So um, thank you for, for bringing that up, Shannon. I think that's a fantastic idea of utilizing sort of the, the local organizations. So um, we're going to move on to another case. Um, I, I have some cases that I can certainly present from some of my colleagues, um, but I want to see if anybody wanted to, to try out presenting a case um, or if they had a case that they wanted to bring to the group. on language and stigma. Okay, I'll, I'll do uh, the second case, but um, be thinking of potential cases um, that you might want to present if we have some time towards the end. Okay. I'm just getting set up here so I can make some notes. Oops. All 
Okay, so the question posed by this case is how should we call out stigmatizing language used by coworkers? So let me talk about a, the problem that I came across here. So this was actually a nurse colleague that shared this story with me. Um, she said that she was um, seeing a patient with the medical team. Um, so uh, they were about to go into the room to see the next patient on their list, a man with opioid use disorder um, admitted with cellulitis, um, so infection of the skin and abscess of their right arm. And one of the residents, so one of the, the um, doctors in training uh, mentioned in reference to the patient, I've seen this quote addict admitted at least five times since I started residency. He goes home, relapses, comes in with abscess or cellulitis. I'm not sure he'll ever get clean. And the, the nurse who brought up the story said, you know, I didn't know what to say. Diving a little bit deeper on, on her perspective, the nurse said, I felt like I was the lowest person on the totem pole. But she also wanted to be like, if this was your family member, would you describe him in the same way? Um, the nurse mentioned that they had been working with the patient for a few days and the patient was really caring and nice. Um, they even told me, the nurse, um, they were intentionally avoiding asking for pain medication because they didn't want to be seen as pain seeking. Okay. And the reason um, this nurse brought up this case is um, that they felt like there needs to be more education across the board on stigma. And there are probably good ways to talk about um, stigma and language um, without putting people on the spot. So that's our case. Any questions or clarifying comments about the case? Any initial reactions to hearing this? Hi, Dr. Oler. So I guess initially my thought um, is that we don't assume that um, even as medical professionals that we all share um, appropriate language, understanding, education about this. So maybe, yeah, of course, first educate. Um, and then secondly, um, maybe just establish some um, expectations, you know, at first that, hey, we're gonna hold each other accountable. And when, <laughs> you know, when one of us don't use the appropriate terminology, we're gonna, you know, um, you know, address it and, and maybe just establish that first and foremost, now how to do that tactfully and appropriately, um, of course, <laughs> I guess is the true question. Great point. Um, other thoughts or initial reactions? I, I think that uh, the lowest person on the totem pole piece is going to be the elephant in the room for some of us who are not clinicians and recovery mm -hmm. coaches in trying to make our voice heard and having that confidence that our voice is going to make a change. So from, I guess it's for you and the group, how can we you know, be bold and, and what would steps would we take to, to share our voice uh, that it will be heard? 
So the totem pole problem. <laughs> it's a good one. Dr. So, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Kathy. This is Kathy Miles. I think my first reaction was if if the nurse's uh, re reaction was um, that strong and she felt that that badly about how uh, about the residents uh, words, what kind of message do, does the patient, the client get? So, mm -hmm. you know, we can all if we put ourselves in the in the place of that person, then we can think about what it's like for them to feel that um, stigma. Uh, it, it, and then the other thing is, it, it seems to me like in doing a lot of public education uh, around uh, the neuroscience of addiction and, and watching people in trainings, just people in the community that we've tried to do, watching them have those aha experiences of, oh my goodness, I've been looking at this wrong all this time. It still looks to me like for all of us, it, because this our culture has been so wrong about addiction for so long, for all of us, it, it's a it's an unpeeling of the layers of the onion, really. I mean, it 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 you can't just all of a sudden say, oh yeah, it's a disease. I understand it. It's you have to examine yourself, and and it just takes a while. And I, that's why I believe so much in training and continuing education. It's just so important and it, it's important for HR managers, for everyone in the hospital. I mean, we just need to be doing more of it. I love that, Kathy. Um, was there someone else who was going to jump in? Um, this is Shannon. And then um, I know um, Natalie said she had a, an experience to share, but I just want to say that um, it could be, you know, just the culture of the workplace, but I'm I'm a person in recovery, I'm not a clinician, and I sit in on um, treatment meetings so I can hear about how things are going with my clients. And um, I feel completely, uh, I'm, I feel that I'm allowed to say um, whatever my personal experience is, and I kind of try to stick with the, um, you know, experience, strength, and hope thing from AA, like yeah. uh, what it was like, what, you know, what I did about it, and then what the outcome was. But I feel like I don't have a degree, but the personal experience is respected. And I feel like that's where the authority comes from. So I think if you can just rest in the fact that you have experience and people who have, you know, gone to school and read about it, they they respect that. I think um, that's the way that I've seen it, not just in, in my workplace, but um, in conferences and things like that. I just want to remind people in recovery that you know, think of all the times that you've heard a clinician asking for your opinion and remember that they want to hear that um, and it will be heard. Absolutely, your, your experience matters and, and it, it, it is the only way um, that we as, as medical providers can better understand um, uh, where those patients are, are coming from, right? Because many of us do not have that, that same experience. Natalie, I want to uh, uh, move things to you to, to share an experience if you'd like. Um, I previously worked in a men's residential um, treatment facility. And um, with that company, a lot of the employees were people that had went through their program. Mm -hmm. And um, what I found was um, a lot of our clients and stuff would come to me and just be, you know, they'd ask me, you know, what did you used to use? Well, yeah, I, you know, at many times in the house, I was the only one that hadn't had substance disorder or anything. Yeah. So, um, but a thing that I ran into was um, just a lot of them like picking at each other and most of the time it was in fun but um it would eventually turn into well you're saying that I still have a problem but um even with them picking at each other you know me being new to um that type of environment you know I didn't really know what to say to him but I did have a nurse that trained me and she was in recovery and she um kind of led me to 
know how to truly interact with them. So, um, yeah, yes. use, use an eye opener. <laughs> Yeah, so I think what I'm taking away from that is it's really critical for people who maybe do not have that experience of recovery of finding their guide, right? Whether it's the peer that you're working with um, alongside and taking care of the patient, um, whether it's um, you know somebody else um, that you're training with that that has that experience, finding that guide um, can be really critical there. I want to jump to a few things um, in the chat box that have come up. Um, uh, Dr. Lofwell uh, made a good point of you know comparing this to um, uh, other medical issues, right? Um, and and the need to when co-workers, um, and in this case, I'm talking about my co-workers who are medical professionals are using this type of language. Um, it's really, really important for them to hear that not only is it stigmatizing, but it's just ineffective in, in, um, in actually uh, uh, delivering the best possible care for a patient, by which I mean, um, you know, an addict doesn't mean anything to me. Um, somebody with opioid use disorder um, and severe opioid use disorder at that, in my mind, I can begin constructing, here are the issues that that individual might be dealing with, and here are the effective treatments for that, right? Um, addict doesn't help me. Same thing with clean or dirty. That doesn't help me when reviewing a urine drug screen. Um, and so for some individuals who are not responding to hey, this is stigmatizing, this is potentially hurting somebody by using this language. Um, we can use the, the language of efficacy and say this is just ineffective language in describing what's going on and, and figuring out what might be most helpful. Um, and Dr. Luffwell, um echoes that in saying there is frustration among healthcare teams uh, with all patients who can't get who can't help get better, but they don't tri typically try to withhold life-saving medications that decrease um, risks of death and other medical adverse consequences. Right, so um, what the resident was probably trying to say in this situation um, was that they were just feeling a lack of hope and not knowing how to help this individual. Um, and the best way to help this individual is, is by using non-stigmatizing language um, and uh, knowing the effective treatments and not withholding those treatments that can get them moving in the right direction. Go ahead, Dr. Lawful, you want to say something? Yeah, so this, I hope I don't put my foot in my mouth, which I can sometimes do so, but I'm gonna assume that you all are a friendly audience and um, if it comes out wrong, that you'll help me say it better. Um, I think that sometimes when we're talk, like when we're talking about what about the illness, that I agree that I want recovery for everyone, but I think that sometimes the other medical terms are left out, and that really hurts us. We never we need to be talking about remission um, because that's how, at least in the medical system, like we talk about remission of cancer, and that's what those those you know teams are going for they're trying to put all the evidence that there's active disease into remission um and we do similar things like with diabetes you know we're trying to get better control uh, we know the person may always be diabetic and um you know may not always need to go on to insulin but we're like even when they're like really struggling and being readmitted and not being adherent to their medications we're still thinking about what what the benefits are of the treatment. So like with insulin, we're helping the person stay off um, dialysis because there's still benefit, even if they're not perfect, the perfect patient with the perfect diet and exercise and everything that we can still prevent really bad things from happening. They can still, you know, retain limbs and not end up having, you know, amputations. And I don't think we're, we're seeing addiction as an illness enough. We're not teaching about it and like putting the connection between how the medication is really helping manage an illness. Like maybe we're not gonna get a recovery that looks as beautiful as every peer support specialist here, frankly. Um,
but that we cannot have the perfect be the enemy of the good. And so I, I just say that some people, I, my, I worry about putting my foot in the mouth because some people will say, well, like I'm anti-recovery or something. And they're like, that's not what I'm trying to say at all. I want recovery for everyone. I want it for my patient with schizophrenia. I want it for my patient with bipolar disorder. I want it for my internist colleagues who are taking care of like CHFers and, you know, like, and that's how we like get around, like getting toxic about readmitting like the same people and over and over and over again, as we think more about managing and not curing. And we don't just see one endpoint. So that's my. What, what, thanks so much, thoughts. Dr. Lawal. Um, lots of good points there. I, I did want to kick things over to, um, uh, I don't know how to pronounce your first name. Is it Sil, Sorel? Who is Hi, yeah, I'm it? Sylvia actually, but oh, okay, but, yeah, it's just it's probably signed up under my Zoom, whatever. Sylvia, um, go. yeah, sure, so, yeah, I'm Sylvia Sorel Sewell, um, and I'm a physician, but I'm also you know the advocate for plenty of relatives who've been admitted, yeah. and I really noticed when I had a relative at the Mass General the exceptional patient-centered care that they gave a relative of mine who was very ill for eight days. And having been, you know, at times and attending at UK and having worked in the past 25 years in a variety of settings, including recently in the opiate use disorder setting, mm -hmm. I was incredibly struck by what had been words in a lot of places here in town. Like, yeah, we're trying to do it. You know, we mean the best for our patients, but they were really doing this job of what we all say we wanna do. And in this case where sure, it's a trainee, we all know residents are tired, they get frustrated easier. So they're gonna slip. Because we've all seen residents, or many of us, I assume, have seen residents who just want the patients to get better <laughs> Yeah. and go home because you know they have so many admissions and they don't want more admissions. Whereas a regular physician can maybe be a little more patient, but I've also watched colleagues who are older maybe, again, use more stigmatizing language. And that's been frustrating, but I've been lower on the totem pole. And to be in a place where literally everyone from the cleaning staff to the attendings just focused on being kind. Yes. And just focused on the problem and how could they best work on what was the patient's problem was astounding to me. And we all have learned these words, patient-centered care, but I really felt like if we just said, okay, we have these patients, their problem is opiate use disorder and they've got cellulitis is their admitting mm -hmm. problem. You know, I mean, it's just, I felt it and I was so compelled in my tiny bits of free time to call a friend of mine who's a chaplain and a mission specialist here yeah. and just send some pictures and say, oh my gosh, you've got to see how these people are actually carrying it out. Yeah. So I, I just, I felt like I had to put out that word patient-centered care and just think to back the very first person who said, if this were your relative yes, or if this were you, and if we can help the trainee or the colleague in some subtle way, because it's always hard when you watch somebody else do something that isn't kind yeah. to get them to be kind. It's that simplest thing we try to teach our preschoolers at home or our Sunday school kids if we're teaching Sunday mm -hmm. school. You know, it's just hard to get a busy working colleague to do that. So that's, so we, that's, that's uh, my point. I love those points, right? Uh, and a, a couple of critical things there. So one is if you have that personal or that family experience, sharing that so that you're putting a, a face to the challenge and the opportunity that we're, we're facing here. Um, I think that's really critical. But the other thing that you pointed out is, is that when an institution from the top down is saying, this is how it needs to be because this is effective patient-centered care, that makes a huge difference as well. Um, and it makes it easier for those who are, and I hate this term, but we've come back to it a couple of times, lower on the totem pole to feel like they are making a difference as well, right? Right. Um, so thank you for that. In the chat box, just wrapping up here, um, I'm getting, a, we're getting a couple of amens. Uh, root of the problem in society, it, generally most people do not view it as an illness. We have so much more work to do on that. Um, 
and uh, it continues unfortunately to be seen as a moral failing and we can all do our part to change that culture ripple effect would surely be noticeable um excellent so um let me clear these so in this example using the same um, features here so you're gonna again click the annotate button and then the stamp let us know um, where you're at and how comfortable you feel addressing a similar situation where a coworker is using stigmatizing language. Um, while people are doing that, can I share something that um, the case study made me think about real quick? Absolutely, Shannon. Um, so whenever um, it was the part where it said like he didn't wanna seem like he was uh, drug seeking, Yes. Um, so I had a friend um, who's he's got substance use disorder and he was um, in recovery, participating in the programs and all that stuff. Um, and we were trying to play Dungeons and Dragons one day and his stomach was hurting so bad. And we were like, what's going on? Like, why you can't even you know focus on a game? And he said he had gone to two doctors and they just felt like he was drug seeking. Mm -hmm. And I asked another doctor, like, how can how can someone who like the doctors know they have a history and now they're coming for, um, you know, a legitimate issue, um, how can, you know, the patient kind of advocate for themselves? And he said, well, the first thing is like, if you can set up a primary care that gives you, you know, a little bit more authority or whatever. And so whatever the, the, the answer is like what he could have done to advocate for himself. I think if, if you find yourself, feeling that stigma, like we all, like I'm in recovery and I still have stigma against people um, sometimes. So if you find yourself feeling like you don't know, you know, what to do, or you think that they are drug seeking, I would say like, don't, um, maybe don't show that or don't communicate that necessarily to the patient. But like, if what you need to see from them is, you know, a primary care, or you need to see some kind of history or something, then just start with the solution of that and say, okay, well, let me link you up with this person who can set you up with the primary care so that the person feels like something is being done for them. So you don't have to reveal that you think their motives are impure. You can just go ahead and start solving the problem, even if that means delegating it to somebody else in the healthcare industry or a peer or whatever. Um, but I think that really would have helped him because then he didn't want to go back to the doctor and he got really sick over it. Yeah, and this is something that, uh, thank you so much for sharing that, Shannon, and it breaks my heart every time I hear stories like that of care that's delayed um, or diminished as a result of stigma. Um, and what Dr. Sorrell was saying was important is, is that, um, you know, providers, whether they're doctors, nurse practitioners, um, RNs, um, social workers, are pulled in so many different directions um, that, um, unless they are hyper aware um, that their own biases or their own um, stigma towards uh, patients who are struggling with, with opioid use disorder, if, uh, if they are not aware of that and how it might um, color their view of a, even a common complaint like abdominal pain, um, there's a lot of work that, that needs to be done there. Um, I'll, I want to cite, I'm glad you brought this up, like that, in a sense, in essence, is discriminatory care of this individual, right? Um, and there was a recent study looking at patients who were hospitalized with complications uh, stemming from their opioid use disorder, and then they were referred to post-acute medical care, things like nursing homes um, uh, or acute rehabs to help get stronger and heal. Um, and this study found that four out of 10 patients with opioid use disorder were not accepted at post-acute medical care facilities due to their opioid use disorder or the fact that they were on opioid agonist treatment like buprenorphine or methadone. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and so, and, and that behavior didn't change before or after a major um, Americans with Disability Act um, a case in uh, Massachusetts where that study was done. And that just points to, you know, not just at our institutions, but society-wide, um, the work that we still have to do um, 
and uh, the challenge that we're facing here. So I think with the time that we have left, we're a little bit limited. And so what I'd like to do is um, instead of jumping into another case, um, I'm going to go to a few sort of summary slides here. So let me just clear our drawings. Thanks for putting in those stars, everyone. Hopefully that was fun. Um, all right. So we talked about this earlier. This is a great reference slide um, uh, and you can feel free to steal this um, and use it with your colleagues um, as you're educating them about um, uh, language to use um, when talking about opioid use disorder. Remember that stigma can come from multiple um, uh, vectors really. So um, there's uh, certainly stigma within the recovery community, which we highlighted um, earlier today in our first case. Um, there's stigma from healthcare workers, which we highlighted in our, our second case. We uh, spoke to the need for really institutional um, change in both of those cases, but also direct action of, of individuals within those communities to better serve the needs of, of people who use drugs. Um, there can be stigma from outside. Um, we talked about you know, the skilled nursing facilities um, that might be um, holding stigmatized views towards individuals um, with opioid use disorder, but this can be from family or employers. We didn't even touch on um, uh, issues around employment and stigma um, for individuals who are in recovery and remission of their opioid use disorder, but that's a huge um, concern. And then stigma from within, um, when you are being told that you are just pain seeking year in, year out with every admission um, related to your cellulitis, you start feeling like our, our patient in case two, that stigma of, of I don't wanna be seen as this um, quote unquote pain medication seeker. Um, one useful um, thing to be able to talk about in, in, in when we're talking about stigmatizing language is the difference um, between physical dependence and opioid use disorder. Often we hear, hey, isn't buprenorphine or methadone just trading one drug for another? Um, and when I hear that, I often respond by talking about, you know, my understanding of the disease of addiction of the brain um, is that it's a little bit different from physical dependence. Physical dependence is the fact that people develop tolerance to opioids, meaning that they need more to get the same effect and experience withdrawal when those opioids are stopped or reduced. Whereas the disease of opioid use disorder is a chronic brain disease where physical dependence might be part of it, that, but there's other domains of life that um, uh, are negatively impacted by use. By, so yes, buprenorphine and methadone may cause physical dependence, but when you correctly, those other domains of a client's life, employment, family, legal, all those improve and they're able to achieve remission of that disease. Let's remember that um, stigma um, or uh, conditions where there's stigma surrounding them um, are often conditions where there's high perceived control and um, there's internally perceived cause um, when society looks at that particular issue. Um, and we talked in our last session about how the WHO um, uh, recently did a study on chronic diseases and which ones had the most stigma. And uh, 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 substance use disorder was up top um, at number one, alcohol use disorder was number four. Um, HIV was in that, that top four as well. Um, so that's the level of stigma that we're dealing with. I left a few reference in, in here for um, you all. Um, to, if you want to, to learn more about changing language and to change um, the culture of, of treatment here, um, and again, appreciate your time. 